Mr. Harvey, it is uh, with the deepest respect and admiration that I have the uh, opportunity on behalf of everyone in this room to say thank you. Thank you for what you've brought to our business. Thank you for what you've brought to our lives. And thank you for being our 2003 R&R News Talk Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Harvey. Good afternoon, Americans. <laughs> well, the highest compliment of all is to be, well, the highest compliment is when the girl of your life says, I do. But second, it's when you are saluted by your peers. Walter, the, uh, the pauses are sometimes just because I'm overwhelmed in a search for words. My ABC colleagues have often threatened to save up all the pauses in the Paul Harvey News broadcast. <laughs> sells more spot announcements in there. <laughs> and on that subject, I'm proud that some of you sponsors willing to put your money where my mouth is have made this pilgrimage today. Thank you for your presence. Be still, my heart. I have ever to remember what Walter Lippmann once said, that self-importance has ruined more good journalists than bad liquor. On KDOO in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at the age of 14, I was encouraged once in a while to overhear somebody say, hey, that Paul Harvey sounds pretty good for his age. Recently, I've had mixed feelings when I, over <laughs> when I overhear the same thing. <laughs> there were a lot of WKRPs between Tulsa and today, between then and, and this award. But then one day it was no longer just radio and me. We were three, and the adventure took on a whole new dimension. And Angel, would you please stand? <laughs> and so with an angel on my shoulder and a gifted son by my side, I can take only a fraction of the credit for this accolade. Those of us who flit about the fickle, flirtatious flame of fame, pretend to many motives, but make no mistake, we do enjoy the dance. The trick, of course, is to be warmed by those flames without being consumed by them. In my experience, that objective has been aided by having a wife who is wiser and a son who is smarter. My wonder-filled adventure in journalism began figuratively sitting at the feet of an Emporia, Kansas editor I never met, William Allen White of the Emporia Gazette. It was he almost alone who brought middle America to the attention of the world. Nobody better than Mr. White ever reduced the world's complexities to shirt sleeve English that anybody could comprehend. My professional ambition was and still is to serve his constituency. And should you visit my skyscraper offices in Chicago, and you're always welcome, your attention will focus first on a large portrait in the reception room wall. It's a portrait of a young boy 
His clothing dates itself to a generation past. The plus fours are wretchedly wrinkled. The misshapen shoes are worn out. One of them is worn through. But the boy, leaning forward on one elbow, is listening and wrapped to a 1930s vintage cathedral-shaped multi-dial radio. The boy does not resemble any person in particular except to me. The artist is an Oklahoman named Jim Daly, whom I have never met. But with his painting, he included this note. He said, there is no way for me to express the pleasure I received from listening to the old radio programs. In my mind, those wonderful heroes were magnificent. No movie, no television program, not even real life could have equated what my imagination could conjure up. Amazingly, all of those heroes, he says, looked a bit like me. And all of those heroes, he described, looked a bit like me. Radio people in their preoccupied haste have been letting go sometimes of the might and majesty of the well-spoken word. Van Gogh is pleasing to the eye, but Shakespeare is fathomless. Special effects for all of their sophistication are still not as effective as human imagination. Fourth and fifth graders surveyed say that after seeing a Harry Potter movie, when they try to reread a Harry Potter book, their imagination is constricted, limited by what they have seen. Quidditch was much more fun in our mind's eye. So distinct is the disparity that the publisher of the books will use no scenes from the movies on the covers of those books. You trust me to paint, you trust me to paint pictures on the mirror of your mind, and I will let you feel such agony and ecstasy, such misery and such magnificence as you would never be able to feel by looking at it. Let me paint you a, a picture of unrequited love in 17 words. When the fire in me meets with the ice in you, what could remain but damp ashes? Now you tell me what picture in all of film could you duplicate that pregnancy, that poignancy. We court with the lights turned down. That's to remain undistracted. We savor a fragrance or a kiss or a foot massage with our eyes closed. Or comedy. In a book which Paul Jr. and I put together for what it's worth, I was able to match cartoon sketches with some of the stories not this particular one. On page 135, you will meet Martha and Chris Gertson of Gehring, Nebraska. Every weekday afternoon at two, Martha lowers the window shades, disconnects the telephone, turns on the TV to watch the wrestling matches. Martha admits that she loves to watch those big bruisers headbutt one another and body slam one another. And then when she gets sufficiently worked up, she throws a step over toe hold on her husband, Chris. <laughs> and there on the floor in front of the TV set, they wrestle until one is able to pin the other. Don't you tell Martha Gertson that wrestling matches on TV are staged. She says if there's anything on TV that's staged, it's the soap operas. She says the wrestling matches, those are for real, including hers with Chris which, by the way, she usually wins. <laughs> Martha Gertson is 76. <laughs> Her husband, Chris, is 83. <laughs> now that picture, which you have been imagining, is infinitely more entertaining than any cartoon of the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, you all can't comfortably say this, but I can. Your roots are deep 
and strong, or you would not have weathered the evolution of your industry with such consummate grace and dignity and responsibility. News-related radio programming is evolving, as you know, at a frenetic pace. In the beginning of my career, when ABC was still part of NBC, there were three clearly defined categories of news people. First one became a rip and read reporter, epitomized by Lowell Thomas. After an appropriate apprenticeship, the reporter might qualify himself to be a news analyst, and then he was able to explain the news. H.V. Kaltenborn was a very good explainer. Eventually, a venerated analyst, competent to comment, was designated a commentator, and Elmer Davis epitomized that category. In today's scramble for audience, hip shooting, phone callers from anywhere can comment on anything. News has become reactive, and the reactor is encouraged to react to everything. It can be argued that news people have always been covert commentators, shaping their broadcasts, if only by their choice of what goes on the air and what goes in the wastebasket, but, but never overtly. Today's television allows a nameless, faceless, proactive commentator behind the scenery to put words in the teleprompter and thus into the mouths of the talking faces, and the most surprising innovation to a pragmatist accustomed to swimming upstream, the most surprising contemporary transition is the willingness of the Foxy Fox Network to achieve a conservative balance in news handling. Instead of trying to influence the audience, Fox is deliberately shifting its center of balance by enough to the right where the numbers are. So what do you know? What's old is new again, including including the technology of the 30s, tube amplifiers, ribbon microphones, and networks relearning what individual station operators never forgot, the so-called star system. And if you listen closely these days, you will hear advertisers rediscovering how to move merchandise with logic. Some of us have never done it any other way. You Americans were born into a, 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 a nest of eagles. You have survived the mockingbirds and the parrots and the cuckoo birds and the rise and decline of TV until again this past year in our ABC network and the hen that lays a good egg has a perfect right to cackle in our ABC network the one profitable member of the Disney family was radio. <laughs> Confucius is said to have said one picture is worth a thousand words. Ha, ha, ha. Anybody remembers about Confucius? Not what he looked like but what he said. <laughs> As a boy, I fell in love with words and ran away from home and joined the radio, and it really was something. Close your eyes and see. It still is. Advertisers in the United States this year will spend $249.3 billion, and by the way, that's 5% more than last year, telling us all of the good things, real and imagined, about their respective products. Isn't it a shame that with noisy, distressing, depressing news, hour after hour, day in and day out, by our emphasis on all of the bad things, crime and inflation and pollution and floods and fires and discord and discontent, by our persistent preoccupation with negatives, we tend to unsell ourselves and our children on a way of life which, in fact, is the envy of the rest of the world. And that repetition is effective. I tell you, repetition is effective. Repetition is effective. <laughs> Bob Barker asked a game show contestant for $500 named two famous brothers who made it possible for men to fly 
Without a moment's hesitation, the contestant replied, Ernest and Julio. <laughs> Jennifer, take care of that treasure, but don't get accustomed to having it with you. In my Chicago home, I'm going to place that where I can see it every day at 3.30. That is the other 3.30. <laughs> That's when I arise to wash and dress and eat and drink and look at things and talk and think, and only God knows why. But I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to rediscover whatever resolve it takes to keep on keeping on. It still, it still just doesn't seem logical to me that a fellow can be honored for doing every day what he most wants to be doing every day. It does not seem logical, but then as Cowboy Perk Carlson always used to say, if life were logical, it's men who would ride side saddle. <laughs> First time in a long professional lifetime. <laughs> the first time that I ever missed even one broadcast for health reasons was two years ago and sentenced to silence. I had to confront the possibility that I would not be back, maybe not be back on the air ever. I was not ready for that. There were a few more footprints I had hoped to leave behind for my colleagues, especially for the very young ones. I guess I imagine that the journalists in the bullpen were not quite warmed up yet. And somebody had to be around to keep re-reminding them that tomorrow always has been better than today. And it still will be. But they have plenty of time to mature now with the rusty pipes renewed and a reminder like this to re-inspire me, I, I just might repeat something that I told Al Peterson three years ago. I have made up my mind to go on forever. Good day. <laughs> <laughs>